Hello, everyone. Git Uvent. This is Shabbos. Shabbos Uvent uh, of the uh, Vanguard Circle of the Jewish Socialist Bund. I just talked to you in Yiddish. I said this is a Shabbos evening of the uh, Vanguard Circle of the Jewish Socialist Bund. Of it's Shabbos. It's Shabbos. I wish I had somebody to speak Yiddish with, you know, like the oh, Zionists yeah. have, I mean, have I've heard Yiddish. Yeah. Oh, well. I mean, you know, imagine, you know, like your own indigenous language and you have nobody to speak it with, you know, like how bad can it get? <laughs> anyway. So as I was telling you, I've been reading this book by Daniel Boyarin, which is magnificent. This is a, a Bundes book published by Yale University mm -hmm. Press. He's a really good writer, very abstract thinker, incredible discussion. You know, he's a Talmudist. So he comes to the same conclusions as the Bund, but by way of his Talmudic studies. So he goes into this really elaborate sort of, you know, discussion of what it is to be a nation and national consciousness and all of that, you know, which I haven't seen anywhere else. We started to discuss it, you know, in the uh, Jewish Bundist movement and the writings of the uh, of the uh, Bundes martyrs that are collected in the Manual of Revolution, but he goes further even than they have. But it's a discussion that's well worthwhile getting into here. I have some quotations that I'll bring to your attention. But uh, what has? Uh, oh yeah, you got called a yid today by a Klansman. Yep. How stereotypical that. Can that be, you know? I mean, they don't even know what it means to be Jewish. They probably think uh, Protocols of the Elders of Zion were real document. Uh, uh -huh. Well, in Quebec here, Jewish people are supposed to have horns, even. You know, that's how far it goes. Huh. Yeah. According to the that's... Catholics, the old Catholics, which is what we have there, here. In I, Quebec. I saw this uh, video the other day of what's called the German-American Bund, not to be associated with the uh, yes. the Jewish Bund, but uh, this guy named Fritz Kuhn was talking about how uh, how Jews allegedly have cloven hooves, tails, and horns. Tails too. Oh, wow. Well, actually, I I I'm, uh, do have one vertebra of a tail left over, but so does everybody else. So as that's as far as the tale story goes. Wow. That was a Klansman who did that, huh? Who called you Yid? Yeah. Well, yeah, races pop up in the most unusual of places, surprisingly, when you think, no, it can't be, but it is, that sort of thing, yeah. Okay, now, check this out, though. Yeah. Here's some quotations. Okay, first of all, he uses the, the Bundist uh, election campaign poster image of the uh, Jewish Bundist screaming. And he's oh, shouting, uh, yeah, and, and uh, it, in Yiddish here it says, uh, wherever we live, that's our homeland. That's actually my YouTube channel's uh, profile picture. Ah. Okay, so he gets into... Maybe I could put the camera up here. Uh, the no-state solution. This formulation, no-state solution, was first used by the uh, anarchists in 2008, uh, uh, some guy with a pseudonym uh, referred to that and tried to explain it, but it really didn't have an explanation. You know, the anarchists don't have any idea of how actually to make a no-state solution because they don't recognize nations, at least most anarchists. The most sophisticated anarchists, like Rudolf Rocker, of course, do recognize national consciousness. So once you get to that point and you can recognize national consciousness without uh, considering it to be a state, then you're on your way. 
And, in, and that's precisely what he does here. He explains the whole nature of national identity and he calls it a Jewish manifesto and uh, uh, Judaite, he calls it, you know, Jewishness, Yiddishkeit. And he, he explains in detail why having a national consciousness does not mean that you have to have a state. And he talks about the diaspora, which is a Greek word meaning dispersed. It doesn't mean exile. The Hebrew word for exile is galut. But diaspora means, you know, where people are living, you know, because they like to live in that particular country and they make it their homeland. That's it. That's all. You know, no big deal about an exile. And he elaborates that concept oh. as well. And then he connects it with the Jewish blood. Okay, let me pick out some some juicy quotes here for you. Uh, mm hmm Ah. Uh, I'm going to be offering, explaining, and defending a newish proposition, a third position, that the Jews are a diaspora nation. I hope to show, or at least make plausible, the idea that it is a serious error to argue that the Jews are just a religion in order to avoid affirming the Jewish nation state and that it is possible to imagine nations without states, not as an anomaly or a deficiency, but as a significantly better way to organize human or Jewish cultural vitality without sacrificing the claims for universal justice. Excellent stuff. It's Excellent pretty interesting. Stuff. Yeah. Anti-Zionist, but not anti-Jewish, which is what, you know, the Marxist position that, the cruder Marxist position that is held by many who claim that one has to deny uh, Jewish identity in order to deny Zionism. It's not the case. I got my understanding of what, what makes the state from Joseph Stalin's The National Question. Yes, where every national minority is entitled to self-determination except for the Jewish people. <laughs> right. Why? Because Jewish people don't have a given defined territory that they can call a state or yeah. a province or a, or a uh, autonomous republic, as it's called nowadays, you know, in the Confederation of Russia, which is calling itself a federation. In any case, yeah, that's the, the one problem with uh, Stalin's uh, definition of the nation, because he's a very economist, you know, position. It's an economic definition, in effect, in which you have to have a common economy common class structure, you even have to have a national bourgeoisie in order to be recognized as a nation, <laughs> which is sort of contradictory because they're trying to get rid of the national bourgeoisie. But in any case, that's the way it was. But the way it is now is Bundism. Bundism is making its way you know, into the echelons of the higher academia. It hasn't made its way into the popular resistance movement, though. There still is, you know, a great deal of uh, individualism in which the various individual Jewish people, you know, decide they don't want to be a Zionist. And they may or may not think that it is a denial of Jewishness. But when they do speak, they're not speaking even as Jewish people. They just speak, you know, like as an activist, you know, and then they say at the end, you know, oh, yes, I'm Jewish, you know, like, yes, it's true. I'm, you know, usually the journalist has to ask them, you know, like, if they're Jewish, you know, in order to give some credibility to their to their words. And then they finally come out with it, you know, at the end. But they don't lead with it. You know, you have to come up front and say, you know, I'm Jewish. I'm not a Zionist. The Zionists are not Jewish. <laughs> Period. You know, that's number one. Absolutely. Yeah. And we, the Jewish people, who are not Zionists in our majority, because we don't even live in, in the Zionist state, are going to take down the Zionist monster of a state and ideology. And we're going to restore Jewish consciousness as it is uh, and as it should be, not as an ideology. If we said that, you know, then, you know, there would be an explosion. You know, like, first of all, the Zionists would jump, you know, and say, oh, no, we can't let them say that. 
you know, they would try to suppress it as they tried to suppress me at the vigil. But they can't get away with that anymore. I even won the case in the, the court, you know, giving me the right to present myself in front of the Jewish community campus with a Jewish socialist burned banner saying no to the occupation in French, of course. <laughs> so this, oi, oi. Oi, oi. Okay, pas problème, c'est pas brisé. Okay, I dropped my phone, but it didn't break. Okay, so here. Let me give you another juicy quote. I categorically reject the nation state solution to the continuity of Jewish existence and culture in favor of a diasporic nationalism. Ugh, that's a mistake using the word nationalism. Okay, diasporic nationalism that offers not the promise of security, but rather the highly contingent possibility of an ethical collective existence. Indeed, I oppose the mono-national state itself for all as a proven dangerous and destructive mode of collective life. Revolutionary. And who can get rid of the nation state? Now, only socialism can, because the state belongs to the national bourgeoisie. You get rid of the nation state, you get rid of the nation, national bourgeoisie. <laughs> the two are joined at the hip. Hmm. Ah, the thoughts and ideas bruited here are products not of my head, but of my deep and ongoing conversation with interlocutors, living and dead. I think that's referring to us because he happens to be a member of the Jews who speak out list, email list that has been going for ages. That is uh, the Jewish academics who are anti-Zionist and they've been uh, educated to know about the Bund since a long time. Okay, let's see now. Hmm. It is perhaps time for me to put some cards on the table, as should be clear. I disagree with Sand's book. Yes. Slomo Sand is an ex-Israeli living in France who wrote a book, you know, calling for assimilation because he opposed Zionism. Okay. I disagree with Sand's book and with the ideology that he represents, namely the idea that only by reducing Yiddishkeit to a religion, a faith, with no national character, is it possible to avoid the consequences of statism? This is the Marxist position that he's criticizing, or a pseudo-Marxist yeah. position, because Shlomo Sand, you know, is, is no great theoretician. And he points out how he's picked up this error, which renders, you know, the, uh, you know, so many people's work null because the arguments that they're using are not going to be effective against the Zionists, because the Zionists know that the Jewish people are a national entity. And if someone comes along and says, you know, no, you can't, you can't be a national identity, you know, because you don't have, you know, a common territory, then, you know, they're trying to make an anti-Zionist argument that seems to be bolstering the Zionism in the first place, because of they're telling Jewish people that, you know, that they can't be a nation because they don't have a nation state, then the obvious reply of you know many Jewish people would be, well, in order to be Jewish, then I have to have a nation state. Is that what you're telling me? I never <laughs> looked at it that way, but that actually makes sense. Yeah. So in effect, you know, they're the way that they talk, you know, is convincing people to be a Zionist, not to be an anti-Zionist, because of the nature of the argument that they're using. And so it's very limited, you know, what the Jewish movement can accomplish. Now, of course, there's been a lot of Jewish people who demonstrate, like in Capitol Hall, of the, if not now and not in our name and uh, Jewish Voice for Peace. But that's just a number of Jewish people. It's not a Jewish movement, vanguard movement, saying that we are taking over the leadership of the Jewish people and we refuse to recognize Zionism and the Israel government as the leadership of the Jewish people. If they said that, there would be a revolution. But they don't say that. 
They're just a bag of individual Jewish people who have an ethical conscience. You know, but so what? Okay. Hmm. I disagree with him, Shlomo San, in his contention that racist ideas and the idea that each ethnic group has the right to a state just for them are necessary consequences of nationalism. Yes. Now, the exclusivity of nationalism is found in Christian white nationalism. That's why so many Christian nationalists are Zionists, because they want Jewish people to leave, basically. They have the same position as Zionism. Okay, now, he gets into more Bundist stuff here, too. Ah. But I do not indeed either to become lost in a disembodied universalism. He's against assimilation. I have a different idea of a universal. It is a universal rich with all that is particular, rich with all the particulars there are, the deepening of each particular, the coexistence of them all. Particular means, you know, a particular nation. You know, this was a, a word used uh, even by Trotsky. And he, Trotsky, in his writings about national identity, was against the particular national identities that prevented the unification of a society under a centralized, you know, government. Okay. And he used the word particularities as well, which was a pseudonym for the Jewish people. And Trotsky was against, you know, the national identity of the Jewish people as far as late as 1937, when he changed his position and said that, yes, Jewish people are a nation and will continue to be so in the face of rising anti-Semitism. It took, you know, a Hitler to convince Trotsky that Jewish people existed. Pathetic, really, you know, like you're supposed to be a great theoretician and all that. Okay, what is this now? Hmm. Diaspora. Mm -hmm. Both. Uh, both for the Greek-speaking Jews of the Hellenistic world and for the Semitic speakers of Babylon, at any rate, diaspora was not understood as a negative or even a nominalist condition for the Jews to abide within but one full of creative possibilities. Yes, very true. Because when Jewish people are living in another society with a dual identity, they create in the dialectical consciousness, you know, they pick up the best, you know, of the local culture that they're living with, plus the thousands of years of Jewish culture. And they make a dialectic of the two, you know, that creates stuff, you know, that doesn't exist previously. <laughs> this is uh, a very rich statement here. But he uses the term Jews, you know, which I don't like, you know, because Jews is, you know, like using the term Negro to just talk about the black nation. You know, it's uh, demeaning, very demeaning. You know, that's why I insist upon being identified as Jewish and referring to Jewish people and Jewish person. Personhood. Okay, here's, uh, this is getting abstract. Okay. Yeah, but he does a critique of a whole bunch of other writers too. Very well researched. Ah, the Bund's perspective gives us the model to move beyond it, a prospect for which I will agree, no, a prospect for which I will argue in the ensuing chapters of this manifesto. How more Bundes can you get? Excellent, excellent stuff here. Thus, when Jews claim that Judaism is a religion, we're inevitably falling into a trap, since religion is understood quite differently than Jewish belonging. He's talking about how Christians understood 
understanding of the word religion. We ought no longer to reject Immanuel Kant's uh, notorious observation that Judaism is really not a religion at all, but merely a union of a number of people who, because they belong to a single stock, form themselves into a commonwealth under purely political laws and not into a church. Yeah, even Immanuel Kant, uh, the political philosopher, recognized what the Jewish people are. And yet uh, the Marxists, you know, were unable to do so thereafter because Marx, in when he was young, young Marx, you know, in 19, 1848, wrote this pamphlet called The Jewish Question, in which he blamed Jewish people for our own oppression, basically, and said that assimilation is the sought-after goal for liberation, except that with assimilation there was extermination. Assimilation also failed in Spain under um, Ferdinand and Isabella in 1492. The assimilated Jewish population was expelled to in England. In 1290, the assimilated Jewish population was expelled there as well. In France, too, there was an expulsion of the Jewish people. I, I don't know the, the year even, you know, but it's not talked about. <laughs> Assimilation doesn't work. Okay. And yet, Marxism, you know, classical, you know, like, you know, simple Marxism, and many Marxists, you know, still push the position that Jewish people should just forget about being Jewish, and then there's no problem. Franz Fanon also took that position. The Jewish people can get away with being white, and so they should do so, not even knowing that there were Arab Jews. Okay, the Jewish nation, however, is a community imagined, imagined in time, not space. Interesting abstract definition. It is formed from my connection with my grandmother to her mother and hers until I have included all the generation of my imagined community in time, all the way back to Mother Sarah, and her consort Abraham, of course. So that's his definition of Jewish, of any national identity. He considers it to be more of a, a sociological phenomena than a political economic phenomena. Okay, that's getting a bit abstract. That's very abstract. <laughs> <laughs> getting more and more abstract. Let's imagine now this disaggregating nation from state. It is, after all, only recently that the concepts of nation and state have begun to collapse into each other. In his concept history, world history of nation in Spanish usage, E.J. Hobsbawm has shown that it was only in 1884 that the, uh, the, the association of nation with a state or political body appeared in the dictionary of the Spanish Academy. Even then, it didn't settle there. Since the final edition of that textual monument from 1925, a nation is defined as the collectivity of persons who have the same ethnic origin, error, and in general, speak the same language, and possess a common tradition, period. In other words, in that linguistic cultural world, the association of nations with states as an integral part of their being nations was late and contested. Hobsbawm, a significant uh, theoretician, makes the same point with respect to other languages, including German and Dutch. Yes. Yes. Then he goes into a discussion of the early Zionists who were not status. Very interesting work, very interesting. Now, what we should do now is uh, bring in Shabbos. I remember the, uh, the prayer for Shabbos for lighting the candles. So I'll recite them for you. Oh, you're muted. Uh.
Okay. Now you should can be you hear me now. Sorry about now that. I can't it, hear wasn't, you. it wasn't allowing me to unmute myself, so I tried starting it over. Oh, after you muted yourself. Uh huh. Yeah, that's why I set it up like that. Okay. So here's Shabbos right here. And the prayer goes like this Baruch Ata Odenai. Eloheinu Melacha Alom. Asher Kitsanu Bimitsosav Bitsivanu. The Hadlik Ner Shabbos. That's an awesome menorah you've got. I've got one of my own, but uh, I'm all out of candles. Um, sorry about starting it over. I was having trouble with uh, the muting thing you know so this is uh if we consider you know what the the assimilated marxist jewish uh, mentality is all about this must be considered to be sacrilegious why <laughs> <laughs> because it is religiosity you know not supposed to be banned you know like marxists are not supposed to be religious is banned. I went, oh, there, now you can see the candles. It shows up well. That's awesome. Yes, this is a forbidden activity according to Marxism. Well, <laughs> Marxism forbid the Bund as well. There's a split in 1903. And the communists thought that they had the, the better part of uh, valor. And they ended up destroying their own experiment. The Bund uh, has been vindicated by the disaster presented by Zionism. Bundism is a necessary corollary to Marxism. It is part of a post-Marxist theoretical development, which includes pantherism and the other national minorities called the Fourth World, who are seeking I'm national liberation. Yes, like the the first uh, First Nations of uh, all the colonized and genocided societies of North and South America. They what do you think of the uh, brown berets? Yes. I don't know too much about them, but they must be Mexicans. Mexicas, I think they are called. Yes. Yes. Very good phenomena. So if we can say... I have a... What was that? I have a friend who has a friend in the brown berets. Ah. Is it a big movement? We don't know, actually, do we? That's internal. But there are, uh, I think, 11 million uh, undocumented workers in the United States. And they're eventually going to become documented, as announced by Joe Biden today. <laughs> Joe Biden made a speech today in Michigan in which he came out, you know, as a quasi-socialist, you know, in order to gain popular support. Populist. <laughs> well, yeah, he's going to raise the minimum wage too, you know, like <laughs> everything. He's going to do everything, you know, tax the rich, you know, like greedy rich, you know. He's he made a new theme now, the greedy rich. It's not the national bourgeoisie, you know, but it's the greedy rich, you know. So he's coming off. You know, like a, tax analysis. Yeah. 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 It's funny to see him, you know, look so desperate that he's actually resorting to Bernie Sanders' program. <laughs> Bernie Sanders, if they ran Bernie Sanders, they would win for sure, right? But they don't want to. Yeah. You know, like Biden is is the big risk, you know, they're going to have to stick with him. He seems to be fairly competent. I don't think that's the issue really, you know, but he, in order to compensate for the attacks that he's been undergoing, has adopted this populist program. It's incredible. Uh, all sorts of things, you know, and he also claims, you know, to have provided a solution to the gas war. Oh, yeah, he's done everything now. Yeah. And then uh, um, pharma care and medical care. And I don't I don't think he mentioned student loans, though. He should have mentioned student loans <laughs> just to throw it in to the pie. Desperate, very desperate. But it's oh, only yeah. words, you know, they would. I don't think they would actually sort of implement, you know, even a 
10% of a program like that. Rowan Wade as well. Um, and um, increasing the taxation of uh, billionaires to 25% instead of 8.2%. You know, he mentions this, you know, like, wow. You know, all of a sudden, all the Americans, you know, know how much the billionaires are actually getting away with. You know, this is, he's starting, you know, something that he's not going to be able to control. This is going to feed into a whole socialist consciousness. People are going to start thinking, you know, well, sounds like socialism to me. And that's what they said socialism was, you know, and that's what he's saying, you know, so it must be, must be good. You know, even if he doesn't say it's socialism, that it still must be, you know, socialism that we're moving towards. That's the kind of the mentality that's going to, you know, be picked up by people, not immediately, but after a few sort of, you know, knocks on the head. I think they'll realize, you know, that even, you know, Biden has to resort to a socialist program in order to become credible. Kind of, sort of reminds me of, uh, I don't know if this is necessarily correct, but it reminds me somewhat of the February revolution. In some ways, like there is a social democratic revolution of sorts. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the, the old system had to collapse beforehand. Yeah. Yeah, it sort of collapsed on its own, uh, under its own weight. So I don't expect that to happen, but... Not yet, anyway. No, not yet. But, but uh, United States, uh, all of its pillars, one by one, are, are being sort of taken out. All of its supports by BRICS by Russia, even Turkey is setting up relations with China economically, ignoring For real? Turkey, yeah. And now yeah. Iran, India, Modi has just gone to Moscow to meet with Putin to kiss him <laughs> three times. <laughs> <You know? laughs> this is while a NATO meeting is happening in Washington. You know, like <laughs> it's not supposed to happen that way. It I is. thought Modi was a huge uh, Zionist of sorts. Yeah, yeah, the same ideology. But when it comes to economics, that's another matter, you know, because their consumption of Russian oil has, has uh, increased by 20 times. I, I remember hearing that India and the Soviet Union were also allies at one point. I don't know, but they are now. <laughs> Well, Russia and North Korea, Russia and China. Wow. This is becoming, you know, like a big chess game. And Putin's pieces are all lining up together. And they're all sort of in a common strategy as well. The way the U.S. plays chess is, you know, like, it's a, to bring out the strongest pieces and try to penetrate, you know, the defenses of the uh, of everyone else. Because they're supposed when it to be comes stronger. To India, so. mm -hmm. Because I, I was just going to say, because they're supposed to be stronger than everybody else. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When it comes to India, I, I focus mostly on the uh, Naxal Bari front. Oh, yeah. Yes, the Maoist. The Eastern section, uh, the Maoists have liberated a whole big section of the country. That's right. And then the other, then there's the National Liberation Movement of Kashmir. Then there's the National Liberation Movement of Punjab. And then there's the province in the south that has voted in the Communist Party, a Communist Party, repeatedly. Yeah, there's all sorts nice. of things happening in India. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And in uh, Pakistan, the uh, the opposition is uh, is about to take over, and they've uh, successfully withstood the um, the repression of the existing state. Uh, I forgot the guy's name. But uh, he was interviewed on Al Jazeera, and he's ready to take over. He was put into prison for a while, but he's out now. So Pakistan is going to go through a revolutionary change as well. Interesting. So... Let's see now. I think that uh, covers the major uh, newness of the week. But uh, 
what uh, we can expect to hear from is the International Criminal Court in its uh, indictments of Netanyahu and the other fascist ministers. The ceasefire proposal is going to be debated intensely this week. And uh, maybe Hamas is going to make some progress there because what was being offered previously was not an end to the war. Now the United States is offering to have Arab countries come in there as peacekeeping troops to force uh, and to keep out, you know, the Zionist troops from Gaza and to liberate Gaza and end the war in that way. Okay. But Israel's not agreed to that. And Hamas has pointed that out and, you know, pointing out that, you know, Israel still wants to maintain its military presence inside Gaza, away from major populated areas. But, you know, they're not going to go for that. And rightly so, you know, like, can't leave the Zionist military in there, you know, they can't be trusted at all. Just like they shouldn't have been trusted in 1982 when they allowed for the massacre of Sabra Shatila to take place by their mercenary Lebanese Christian forces called the... Um, Um, what were they called? Falange, the Falanges, which means fascists, basically. It's taken from the Italian fascists. Yeah. So, you know, that's what we ex should expect, you know, like a, some more con contestation about the ceasefire negotiations in the coming week. And perhaps it can succeed. Perhaps Hamas can, can succeed, you know, in forcing them, you know, to uh, withdraw, even if it means, you know, being replaced by Arab troops. And that should be, you know, like a reasonably accepted, you know, by the Israeli public, because, you know, if they're concerned about another October 7th, you know, happening, even though Hamas has said they wouldn't uh, engage in another October 7th, if there was a permanent ceasefire, they wouldn't have any need to do so because they wouldn't be being attacked all the time. So, you know, this is a certain guarantee that should be acceptable to the Israeli public and the opposition is increasing in stature and in force there. And they're calling for uh, Netanyahu to resign for a new government, for the government to fall. The revolutionary movement is developing there. But they still haven't joined up with the Palestinians. They have to have a united front with the Palestinians and then it will get somewhere. That's what I think. Well, Andrew, what have I missed? What have we missed? Oh, you still need it. Yeah. Sorry, there was loud trucks passing by. So, uh, well, as far as uh, like local politics go, uh, there was recently a Klan rally in Nashville, Tennessee. Really? You're in Tennessee, right? Yes. Well, how could this happen? It isn't... Hates, oh yeah, yeah, you're in America. In Canada, hate speech is considered uh, criminal. In the United States, hate speech is not criminal. It's considered to be free. Oh, yeah, the so-called First Amendment right to say anything, yeah. you know, unless it's threatening yeah. those in power. Yeah, and racism is not threatening to those in power, so it gets a free, free card. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, and uh, what did you? What happened at this rally? How many? How many Klansmen uh, were there? Over five hundred. Five hundred. Uh -huh. Okay, that's substantial. That can cause a lot of damage. And the opposition, uh, you know, the the black militia, self defense militia, I'm, I'm sure, is not organized to that extent. Used to be with the Black Panther Party, but they were picked off. They have to get organized again, more organized than the Klan. Because the clan is going to come. They're going to attack. It's inevitable. And we have to be able to defend ourselves. Yeah. There should be another front between... Should... Uh, Sorry, there should be ahead. another front between Jewish, Hispanic, and Black nations. That would bring enough force together to be able to contend with them. Exactly. Yeah. Like, okay. I, I've I think there should be a united front of sorts. Yeah. Especially when we're being faced with uh, Trump's Project 2025, in which he intends to take over the state permanently. 
and turn it into a dictatorship. And with the Supreme Court uh, decision, he can get away with it. It's going to be legal because the uh, president can do no wrong, as Charles I said before he was beheaded. But he said, the monarch can do no wrong. Okay. And then he was beheaded. Okay, he can do no wrong, but he's still beheaded. <laughs> Last words of any foolish man. Yes, yes, yes. I can't believe how ignorant Trump is. You know, like he can barely talk in a sentence. And some say that it's he talks in prose. <laughs> oh, my, 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 my. The guy is, you know, incompetent. Really. But, you know, so was Hitler. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Okay. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing more from uh, Dr. Jill Stein and Dr. Cornell West about their campaigns against uh, both of the bourgeois parties. They're both making some headway, you know, but it's very difficult, you know. And uh, not even uh, an agency like Democracy Now! is allowing them to speak up and speak out because their funder, their major funder of Democracy Now! podcast supports Democratic Party. So they're not going to do anything to jeopardize their funding because they're working on a salary. They're not volunteers. They just uh, push, you know, what they get paid to push. That's not a real sort of alternative media, but it's considered to be so. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this on the air, but I'm actually getting a submachine gun for uh, like self-defense and community defense. That's your right. That's not illegal. You can say that. No problem. You should be. Yes. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll see what uh, what we can get done and uh, what's going to be happening and uh, speak with you next Friday night for Shabbos. Sounds good. Are we going live tomorrow too? Yes, tomorrow is convergence uh, video stream. Yes, in the afternoon, oh. three o'clock. Very good. 